You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello and welcome to an exciting year two fun-filled, wine-filled, champagne-filled episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Cambro. And we're joined tonight by Veronica Soret from Brescom Barton. Veronica, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you very Thank much you for, for joining us. And we're very excited to celebrate our second year as a, a holiday show featuring champagne this year. As you know, last year we just had sparkling. So we're very excited to actually taste some champagne on, on this, this show. This is genuine champagne. Genuine champagne. And hopefully if the Mayan calendar is wrong, all our viewers will be seeing this sometime in <laughs> December, right, Jim? Let's hope well, so. Yeah, sometime <laughs> in December. So if the Mayan calendar is wrong, you'll be drinking and having a good time with us. So I'm really excited to hear about what we have today. So what do we have for our first um, actual champagne? first Veronica? actual champagne is Renart. It is a Blanc de Blanc, which means it's 100% Chardonnay. Um, this is, for those who are not familiar with Renard, uh, it was founded in 1729, and it's the first champagne house in the world. It's funny because I know in our first show we had some controversy, controversy over where champagne was actually discovered or how it was actually uh, started. Right, and the, the so, French and the British are... Or should I pour some more? <laughs> this will be good for now. Okay, <laughs> just checking. Cheers. we got a lot to go through. <laughs> So they, um, they, they say that they're the uh, first? So they say that they founded this in uh, 1729. Uh, Dom Renard is actually, this was his passion, his vision. Um, and it, it shows, it's a very elegant, it's a very boutique-y champagne. Um, I love the fact that it comes in 375 little bottles for if you don't want to spend a lot of money or if you don't want to, if you just want to do a little toast, if there's two of you, you know. I know my boyfriend doesn't always like to drink a whole bottle of champagne, so a little one for a toast is it's perfect. It's interesting, you don't normally see these too often really in the know. stores. And it's nice to see that you have the choice or option of having one that size. Though generally, Jim, when we have our parties, uh, big ones are always... Yeah, the big ones are better. Yeah, they're always yeah. bigger. So, bigger is better sometimes. <laughs> so this... It, it's this a Blanc de Blanc, Blanc so 100% Chardonnay. Wow, that's a very interesting aroma compared to some of the other ones I've sniffed. Today. It is, yeah, and a lot of the, the sparkling wines and champagnes that we've tried in the past have been Pinot Noir grapes, so this is a, kind of a departure for us. Oh, lovely. That's very minerally. I think it's a, it, it's a lot of character in that uh, first taste and a little bit of aftertaste in that. A little, I get a little I, peachy. Peachy? Like peach, and maybe some white flowers. I see the, yeah, the white flowers. Now this is not classified, obviously, as a brut, so this would be paired with something like if you were gonna have this served at a, a dinner or something like, what would you serve this with? Um, you know, I have to say, I am, I'm not a person that will pair this with a meal. Oh, I like that. Just um, drink on itself. I, you know, for me, champagne is made to be had before a meal mm -hmm. and after a meal. Although there's people that will have it, you know, throughout a course of a meal. I mean, if you're going to pair this with some, with anything, just because it is Chardonnay, it will have to be something on the lighter side, something on the creamy side. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing like, let's say a salmon with um, a cream sauce, you know, along those ways that like you can actually pair something like this. But if not, dessert or before the party gets started with some nice strawberries. The best pair in it is popcorn. Yeah, we've talked about that <laughs> in the past. Though so I've uh, yet to try champagne with popcorn, but... I don't think we've done it yet either. 
Have no, we? but I, uh, you recommended that about a year ago. I, yes. And I, I told Bob about it, and we, we've never done it either. It is in every book that you read. It's in everything that you do, mm. champagne and popcorn. You know, I think one of the problems with that, and not that it's a problem, is when we, we have so many parties, we do so many tastings or wine parties, that having just a bowl of popcorn out, it's kind of odd. Seems a little gauche, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it does. But maybe we can put them in fancy crystal bowls or something like that next time we do it. So with, I, with nice little spoons. Nice little spoons, exactly. <laughs> now, the bubbles on this, as we talked about in the past, are, are very fine. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not that's a characteristic of anything specific when it comes to a champagne. Um, well, they say the smaller the bubbles, the better the, the sparkling. So... Um, if you are familiar with Prosecco, Prosecco tends to have a little more effervescence and mm -hmm. the bubbles are a, yep. little, a ton a little bit bigger just because of the way that the, the wine is actually made. Yeah, the, um, the Prosecco does a, a second fermentation in a vat, yes, whereas with versus, the champagne it's usually in the yep. bottle. Now, um, every, every wine that we're going to have here, uh, except for the, um, the Santa Margarita, um, they're all done in the method uh, Champenoise. Okay, so for those of you at home, that means that the second fermentation is going to take place inside the bottle. Yes. I find the nose on this fascinating. I, it's not like anything like I've I, had. I, yeah, I haven't had, I've never smelled anything like that. Not either. at all. Well, I, did, I did shower today. <laughs> no, I like it. It's, so it's, it's definitely very pleasant, not me. <laughs> it's a very pleasant aroma. I just, I can't put my finger I on it. I can't either. It's, it's such a unique um, It's almost, it's nose. a little citrusy for me. The glasses are clean, so I'm sure it's not the glasses that works mine, isn't it? But it, it's it's fascinating. It is delicious. There's fans out there that love Blancs de Blancs, and there's people that don't. For me, if you are not necessarily a, a champagne person and you're just starting, uh, it's a great way to start uh, because it's not too dry. Mm -hmm. It has a good body, um, you know, and you'll and you'll drink it, and it'll just warm you right up, and you'll become an addict. <laughs> I'm hooked already. <laughs> well, as, as, as we've said in our friends in the past, usually where, where there's bubbles, there's always troubles. So, and women. And well, <laughs> yes, that's usually where the trouble starts. So, but that was an absolutely fascinating first one. And what price range are we talking about for this, Veronica? The seven fifty. This will vary anywhere between seventy to seventy five. And for the little one, it's usually in the mid thirties. This also got 92 points on Wine Spectator. Um, so you'll be surprised how many stores you walk in and they don't, they don't have, they don't have Renart. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean they can't get it because it's available mm -hmm. in the whole state and um, it's delicious. And you would suggest this be chilled to a certain degree, not room temperature, obviously, but generally. No, definitely not room temperature. You don't, you know, uh, you don't want it too cold. Like you don't want it at a temperature that you would serve a white wine. Right. But you take it out. And, uh, or you just, you know, if you put it in a bucket of ice, then definitely um, take it out just for a couple of minutes just to let it acclimate mm -hmm. and then and drink it. Um, I'm a fan of drinking white wine a little warmer and red wines a little cooler. Wow, interesting. Um, huh. I, I always order ice bucket with my red wines yeah. at restaurants and people look at me like I'm crazy, but I don't like it too warm. So, but Do you put ice in your wine? No, that's, okay. that's a no-no okay, no in good, my book. That's, that's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> yeah, so. no. Um, so there are new gadgets that you mentioned last time that are coming out where you could actually keep some type of cool element in the glass without... Right, it's a, it's a little uh, object you keep in the freezer, and then you pull it out and put it in the, the wine when you're serving it, and it'll chill the wine down. It's, and it's really for people who are accustomed to putting ice cubes in their glass. Uh, so this way you don't water the wine down, but you still get it cold very quickly. And I still like myself personally when it comes to a, a white wine. I, sm I pour a smaller pour and drink it faster. Absolutely. So it doesn't have a chance it to get warm. It doesn't get too warm. And I Absolutely. think that's a great way to do it. So Absolutely. That was a thumb up on me oh. for this one. I'm giving that a thumbs up Absolutely. also. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to finish mine first. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, why don't you pour the second one for yeah, us? Yeah, the next one I'm sure some of our viewers have seen in, in the stores. It's a Piper. It's probably, uh, you know, it's usually available in some stores. Oh, this is, this is actually well known. So um, yeah. Piper um, Heisek. It started, it was founded in 1789, and back then it was just Heisek. And then around 1839, uh, it became Piper Heisek. It was just kind of like a combination of you know, two people. That, two houses. Two houses that kind of got together. Yeah. Got together. Um, couldn't find, you know, a lot more information than that. And then um, it's been, you know, all over the, the, the press with that, and they have different color labels. And this is the extra dry, so they have the brute, 
and they have the extra dry, they have a rosé. In my, my experience, a lot of people that don't like champagne, they don't like it because of the dryness of it and they want something a little sweeter. That's yeah. why Prosecco has been so big as far as sparkling. So the extra dry has a little more residual sugar, uh, making it a little more approachable for first time champagne drinkers. And actually the terminology is a little confusing sometimes for some of our novices because extra dry doesn't necessarily mean it's as dry as a brew. No. Even though you would think that if somebody saw it, mm -hmm. extra dry would mean right. it's dry. And that's not, that's not the case at all whenever you see an extra dry. It's usually sweeter than a brute. Now this has a completely different aroma than mm -hmm. the first one. So, well, this is also um, about 50% uh, Pinot Noir, and then it has about 15% Chardonnay, and then the rest of it, it's uh, Pinot Meunier, which is the third grape allowed in Champagne. Yeah. And the bubbles are different on this too. I don't know if the camera can pick that up. but This is also, um, Pouring from a smaller bubble, the bubbles just go away very, very fast. Uh, so the minute you put it in the glass, you see them almost disappear, even though they're nice and small. This ones are still like going and very present. Um, and it's also part of the having a 750, but. And maybe we'll do a little side-by-side -side comparison later. And, and all the bubbles? See how fast the, uh, uh, the, the small bottle disappears. That will disappear as, <clears throat> probably as fast as you can drink it. Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> this is another example of how our taste buds sometimes, Jim and I, are different. I find this a little too sweet for my taste. It's a little, uh, there's too much character going on in this champagne for the, me. The sweetness is all up front though. When it, when it, goes, when it comes to the finish, the sweetness disappears. I don't, I don't get any of that. I, yeah, I'll give you that. The, the finish is, is that way. But right up front when you take your first sip, I think it's a little uh, sweet for my taste anyways. But I, in no way does that mean that's good or bad. It just means for me personally that it's another example where I tend to like brutes as yeah. compared to an extra Yeah, dry. I agree with you. Like, I, I get the sweetness in the front, mm -hmm. like kind of like a dry finish in the back. So, this really nice. A, another one that, like you said, Veronica, you might use is um, drinking it on its own before dinner or uh, afterwards. Oh, absolutely. And again, um, the first two are great for people that are not familiar with champagne or they're just getting started with champagne just because there is a little more residual sugar than your normal brute, very dry champagne, which turns to people have a little taste of it and then they get turned off and like, oh, I don't like champagne. So definitely welcome champagne into your home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we always encourage people to go out and do wine tastings. Uh, Absolutely. If, if you find a local store doing champagne tastings, jump right in, try everything. And sooner or later, you will stumble across something that uh, agrees with your palate. So if, yeah, if you tend more towards a sweeter champagne or a sweeter sparkling wine, uh, just taste a lot of them. You'll find something that, that agrees with you. And because it is the holiday, you know, spend a little bit more and uh, try some of the ones we're tasting tonight because you might be pleasant, pleasantly surprised. And uh, oh, by the way, Veronica, can you cellar these champagnes? I don't know if we ever talked about cellaring champagne, oh, what the length is for a cellaring for that. Um, you know, champagnes for the most part are meant to be aged, um, some more than others. And these particular Renart, uh, we have, we just tasted a rosé, it was like, I think it was from 1999. Um, and the color had changed, but you know, the flavor was still there. It wasn't like it had gone bad. Mm -hmm. It was still, it was just a, different than what it would be if you just went and bought it, you know, today. Um, so, but it needs to be stored properly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it has to be room temp, not uh, 55 degrees, mm -hmm. not room yep. temperature. Like if you have a basement, if you have um, a cooler, a wine cooler. It's usually the heat um, that kills any type of It's the wine. heat that kills it, but no, it's also and the, the extremes. So if it's too hot right. and it's suddenly too warm, mm -hmm. too cold or, that will kill the flavor um, of, of the wine, just like anything else. It's like, you know, it's chemistry. So there's molecules floating around in there, and you don't want to shock them. Yeah, as we've been shocked many times <laughs> with a lot of chemicals. So. Absolutely, but, but this, <laughs> this, is, this is all the uh, legal chemicals. That that's, we right. can. <laughs> well, that's the one I met, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> now, something also interesting about these, um, you know, for people that know champagne out there, when they go through the second fermentation, it actually gets hand turned. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the big houses have those mechanical right. yeah. uh, turners. Yeah. So there's actually a person that goes in there and turns it by hand 
all you had mentioned that on the bottles. Last year. Right. Yeah, we talked about that last year. Yep, and that, all the bottles. So that for a champagne mm -hmm. house, that's huge. That's like hand harvesting. Yeah. We were talking about uh, originally, you know, when the French were producing champagne, they were using an inferior glass. It was very thin. Mm -hmm. And so the bottles were, had a tendency to explode. And it wouldn't just be one bottle that would explode. If one exploded, it set off a chain reaction. And yeah. uh, so it was a very dangerous job for someone to go in and turn all the bottles. Yeah. That actually was the controversy, I think. Mm -hmm. Remember, I think I read something that the English tried to make some claim that they developed champagne because they developed stronger glass. Th they were exactly. producing it longer. And they said because some French wine that had been shipped over to England had fermented in the bottle and actually had turned to champagne. Or, no. And that's part of the story. No, but yeah. what happened was the, the French really didn't like the bubbles. They thought it was a faulty wine. Yeah. And so they were, they were appalled every time they, they popped a bottle open and saw bubbles. Uh, but the British really t cling to it and said, you know, this is, this is something we should be serving to the royalty. This is for special occasions. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to pay for it. Yeah, we'll, we'll pay Those for English it. and French have been fighting ever since. <laughs> so, you know, and I read somewhere that it was actually accidentally made. Yes. It you know, mistake. it wasn't kind of yeah, like was bare aspirin. So <laughs> things are accidentally made and suddenly it becomes, you know, huge all over the world. So. Yeah, the, uh, I guess the, the region in France uh, where this is grown, the Champagne region, mm -hmm. was trying to produce wines that were very similar to the Bordeaux region. So they wanted these big, bold, red wines with a lot of body. And uh, what they ended up creating were wines that were flabby, weak. Uh, it was a uh, pale pink color, sometimes a gray color. They were very disappointed by the wine they were producing. And on top of it, it was going through a second fermentation, which they weren't anticipating. Uh, because the, the region got kind of cold, uh, the yeast would shut down. Shut down yeah. And then when the weather warmed up, the yeast would start ac uh, getting active again. And Feeding. there was a second fermentation yeah. that creates the carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. which created the bubbles. Absolutely. And they were so embarrassed by this. Uh, but the yeah the British came in and saved the day and saved champagne. So <laughs> here, here, <laughs> here's here. to the British. <laughs> and what was the price point on this one, Veronica? Uh, that is about between forty-five to like fifty-three. Okay. To be kind of on the safe depending side. On, depending on where you buy it. Depending on where you buy it, but you know it's it's usually you know I've seen it about forty-eight dollars. I've seen it at forty-six dollars. I've seen it at fifty-four dollars. So. So shop around. Shop around. <laughs> well, the rating on this one for me, I'm going to give a half thumb. Not because of quality, but because my palate tends to like a little on the drier side. But it's good, but it's a little sweet for me. I'm going to give it a thumbs up. I, I love the, the, the start. It's not too sweet. Uh, you know, people, people hear us talk about sweet wines, and I'm sure they, they jump to, oh, it's like an Asti Spumanti. It's, it's nowhere near that sweet. Uh, it's, this is not even... No, that's true. It's not, not even Riesling sweet. I mean, it's just a, just a hint of sugar to this, um, and I love the finish. It's, so. it's, a, it's a sugar with finesse. It, that's a great way to... It's a, it's, yeah, it's a sugar with right. finesse. It's not, it's not a sugar that has a syrupy taste to it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it almost like dissipates in your mouth, it just melts and it coats it and it's just, ah, oh, it's warm, it's nice, I like it. She's, she's making me want to have another glass. <laughs> she is. We only have so she much is. time on the show. Actually, right. the next one I'm really excited okay. about because I happen to love a rosé sparkling. All right, do you, and, do you want to uh, pop that one I'll, up? I'll, I'll pop that one, Jim, and I'll let you talk to Veronica while I'm doing this. So this is from Santa Margarita. Uh, so now we are going to Italy and it is very well known. Um, this is the same house that produces, this is a brut, so maybe you'll like it. <laughs> um, but it is, it's an interesting, so this comes from Alto Adige, so now you are in Northern Italy, um, and it's probably one of my favorite places that I've visited in Italy, it's just absolutely beautiful. And it is 50% Chardonnay, it's about 45% what's known as Glera. I have not heard of that varietal. Yes, you have. It's also known as Prosecco. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was going to be my next question. And okay. then it has 5% uh, Malbec. Interesting. That is fascinating. Being Argentinian, I had to gravitate towards uh -huh. of course. the little 5% of Malbec. We actually had that Malbec rosé we had at the gala a few yeah. weeks back, and nobody wanted to try it because they'd never heard of a Malbec rosé before. Yeah. And I thought that was a great wine, too. Um, so is this considered a Prosecco, or is this a sparkling wine? This is considered a sparkling wine. But it is uh, on the drier side. Uh, it has a beautiful color. It sure does. Absolutely beautiful color. And I think you're going to be very pleasantly surprised when you taste it. Um, 
you know, it, it is a name brand. It's, you know, it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, it probably retails for about 29 to 35. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's very elegant. It has a gorgeous pink color. So, and as compared to the last one, I think this one stays sweet throughout the entire There's a more taste. lingering aftertaste yeah. on this one, um, which I find um, not unpleasant at all. No, I enjoy it. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may interject, the last one was a very complex wine. So you had a front palette, a back palette, a finish, everything else. This, on the other hand, is more one dimensional as far as like how the wine is concerned. Yeah. It's not a, a bad thing. It's just, it, you know, it's, it kind of, it stays with you. It enters, yeah. it stays, and it's all the same throughout. Yeah, it's but it, to me, it's a little, it's, I find this drier. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I said, I, I, so, I I'm, like a, I'm, I, well, I'm, I'm, say, I'm yeah, on his side. I'm going to say, <laughs> yes, it's drier than the, the wine we had earlier, but he was mentioning that he didn't like the sweet characteristic. Yeah. Up front. And this, this to me, it's, it is sweet throughout the entire process, mm -hmm. um, and I enjoy that, but I, I do find it to be, I'm just, I was surprised Bob didn't like that one so much and likes this one more. Um, and I got to tell you, when I tried it, I was so skeptical, and then I had it, and mm -hmm. I was like, wow. It, it completely took me, it took me by surprise. I, I, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Well, as we discussed before, Rosés have sort of made a resurgence over the last, I'd probably say, decade or yeah. a little bit less time than that. Um, and you know whether it be in a sparkling or even just a rosé red, um, I've I think we've tasted a few this year. Mm -hmm. I've tasted a few mm -hmm. um, in the past year, and uh, you know I, I tend to like a rosé given the circumstance, like in the summertime, springtime, a nice. And I think they get overlooked. I think people they do. People don't go shopping for rosé, and certainly don't go shopping for sparkling rosé. Um, and I do that. It's, it's, Start shopping for it's that. It's going. Um, when you look at the numbers over the past 10 years, sparkling rosé is on the, on the up. Um, they're getting more and more, and I don't know if it's just a fab because they have a little more hint of sweetness mm -hmm. than some of the other ones, but um, it, it makes a great holiday. I, I agree. Well, and they're sexy. I think it's, I they're, think it's very sexy. Women absolutely mm -hmm. love it. Yep. And uh, if you're having a party and you have just a, and it's a, it's not like a bright pink, it's just a slight. Yeah. Pink color it's, that... I find it very elegant. Yeah, yeah I would say, Veronica, compared to some of the rosé sparklings we've had, this is the lightest one mm -hmm. I've seen. Yeah. So in a way, it almost yeah. fools you a little bit, but uh, the color is there enough to know that you're drinking something that's not a brute or something like that. Yeah. But uh, my thumb's way up on this one. <laughs> way up on this one. Well, I'm going to give this a thumbs up also. And you said you traveled to Italy. Is that how you found this one, or is this just from your experience? Oh, no, I wish. Um, I just represent, I, the, my company represents this wine. Uh, I was in Italy. I've been in Italy several times. I was there last two years ago, uh, and I happened to go to Alto Adige, and it was, I didn't know what to expect. And, and, and it's, like, it's like a country within a country, because it's Italy, but it's German and Austrian. Wow. All in huh. one, and you have, you know, the, the street signs are in two different languages. And yeah, is this near the border? Oh, it's right near the border. Okay. It's like Alto Adige. It's right near Torino, so it's like way, way, way up um, in Italy. And it's, the views are just breathtaking. Mm. And the funniest thing is there's palm trees. So you have pictures of snow all over and the palm trees. And I'm like, how do you guys get to grow palm trees? And of course, the, the ground never freezes. That is, that's amazing. I, I oh, would think the varietals that were available wine-wise must be amazing. Well, they have a lot of, so you get a lot of Gouverstraminers. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of, uh, some, a lot of the Rieslings, um, you know, but you do get some of just regular Chardonnays and, and everything else. Yeah, and it's yeah just, you really don't hear about Gouverstraminers coming out of Italy. No, you do. No, and if you do, they're, they're coming out of Alto Adige. Huh. Absolutely. Well, this is definitely a thumbs up on me. And the price point on this one, Veronica? It's around 29 to 35. Is it 29 39? So definitely affordable, definitely mm -hmm. fun. Um, if you're a fan of Santa Margarita, I strongly recommend that you go and, and look for it and you find it. Um, because well, I'll you be will, finding it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you will not be disappointed. <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah, Bob and I usually uh, try and recommend wines that are under $20, but we always splurge for the holidays. So we, we say, you know, it's, this, this time of year only comes around you know, once a year, and, and we've got to spend a little more. Well, uh, even in the champ sparkling price point, there's still a lot out yeah. there. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, when you hit the, the champagne name, 
you automatically usually jump over the $30 price yeah. point. There are a few that are in that high 20s. Um, not that many, though. But when it comes to especially the holidays or just if you want to try the actual taste and authentic champagne, I would suggest it. So let's quickly jump into our fourth one okay. as time is running low. Okay. And what do we have here? So this is another rosé, and this is a French Accorta. So now we're going to northern Italy as well, a little over in Lombardy, or Lombardia. It's a Brut Rosé. This is owned by the Antinori family. Uh, so French Accorta is the French, it's the Italian champagne, basically. It's done in the Champenoise method. It has three grapes, Pinot Nero, Pinot Bianco, and Chardonnay are the only three grapes that are allowed. Mm. Um, and it's not as much as champagne, but it's done in the same method. So I thought it would be really, really interesting to... Um, Another to very minerally nose on this one, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Wow. <laughs> that is both smooth and delicious at the yeah. same yeah. time. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of French Accorta. Mm. A lot of people just don't really know what it is, but if you ever see it, it's an, uh, an Italian champagne. Well, it, it, it's so smooth and it, it goes down so easily that it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's actually, my tongue still can't calm down. It's still so exciting. <laughs> Good. But uh, before we wrap up tonight, I just wanted to first thank you, Veronica, for oh, sharing welcome. your knowledge and thank you bringing for these great uh, sparklings and champagnes tonight. And uh, Jim, I hope you have a great holiday. Bob, I hope, I hope Veronica, you, too. you have a great holiday. Absolutely. We certainly look forward to maybe seeing you again on the show. Absolutely. I'd love to come back. And for all our... As long as my viewers. You... Your viewers. <laughs> no, my viewers. Like you will be our first back. repeat guest. Okay. Absolutely. Great. And uh, we wish everybody a happy holiday, a happy new year. And until we see you again, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep, keep us, us in, in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.